turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 8, chapter 9. Uh, we may look at chapter 8 a couple times, but uh, primarily chapter 9, 2 Corinthians, beginning in verse num- number 1. Excuse me. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous flurious for me to write to you. In other words, when it came to the, the ministering to the saints, it was something that they should know and understand. It, it really didn't need it to be expressed because it should be something we do automatically. We ought to love one another, serve one another. And he says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, uh, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. They were, they were such uh, uh, righteous-minded people and wanted to help and wanted to do God's work. And Paul had told other people about Macedonia, boasting about them and, and the things they had done, and uh, it caused other people to be provoked with uh, zeal because they heard of good examples. And, uh, you know, there, there's a great deal of truth to that. Uh, whenever you uh, see somebody do something good, maybe it's your wife or your husband or your children or you just see something that a person puts into practice their faith, it uh, stimulates you. I mean, it causes you to, uh, uh, to have a, a greater desire to want to be like that. And uh, when you're around people that constantly discourage you and you never see righteous acts and you never see people uh, that are unselfish and caring it tends to pull you down to that. And it's hard to pull out of that. Paul goes on and he he writes in verse 3, he says, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. So they're going to give an offering, uh, they're going to help, and Paul has sent the brethren in order to uh, be able to get these things that they're going to give and, and use to minister. And then he says, Let's happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Uh, Paul was saying that, you know, he didn't want them to be caught unprepared when Uh, the brethren came and then they didn't have anything to give or the church had grown cold and indifferent and uh, this kind of boasting uh, would not be good if they did not follow through with what they uh, promised they would do. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make you beforehand your bounty Make up beforehand your bounty whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. And uh, the word here for uh, bounty or blessing uh, is is noted uh, that Paul wanted them, this word bounty uh, has been translated in other works as a blessing and uh, if you look it up in Strong's or uh, different word studies, what he was saying was that uh, instead of it being looked upon as some sort of uh, thing that they had to do, it was a blessing. Uh, I sometimes will hear people say, well, we've got to go to church tomorrow. And uh, I'll say, no, you get to go to church tomorrow. You don't have to go. You get to go. Well, God do this God do that. God do no, no. It's a wrong attitude. We we should not look at serving God like it's something that we're constrained to do. We do it because of grace, 
and we do it because of love. And we're all called upon as God's people to demonstrate our faithfulness and care for God's work regardless of what it may cost. Uh, we should be willing uh, to sacrifice to meet those needs and uh, do it as a blessing. Because if you don't, uh, you lose your reward. Uh, what a terrible thing to uh, go to church and be faithful and serve God and then stand before God and hear Him say, I've got nothing to give you because all you did was to do what you did out of constraint. That's why I'm not into this stuff about uh, you know, getting people to pledge money for the year and then if they don't give that money, then you send them a note reminding them that they're supposed to meet their pledge and you can call it faith giving or whatever. I've heard people promote it, but I just don't believe it. Uh, we, we're to give out of love. And, uh, and I don't think we ought to be presumptuous because we don't know what the year may bring. We may say, well, I'm going to give so much money, but uh, you may lose your job. And so you're making a commitment that you don't know you can, you can meet. And we shouldn't provoke people to do that sort of thing. They ought to give out of love and give out of their heart because of what God has done. Because uh, the Bible says God loveth a cheerful, and that word cheerful means hilarious, a cheerful giver. Whenever we give to the Lord, uh, we should not do it in a way that we uh, are sorry for it or that uh, I've heard, I've had people before that would maybe get mad or uh, something happened, they'd say, well, I want all my tithes back from the three years that I've been here in this church. And I'd say, look, when you gave that money, you gave it to the Lord. And that money was used for the Lord's work, and it's gone. It's not going to be returned. It, you gave it to God. Amen. And, uh, but people have the wrong idea about that. And uh, one of the things that we strive to do is to never want to try and make the people think that we're pressuring them and that all we're about is money because that's not what we're about. Amen. Money is a secondary thing, but we give it in order to honor God, not uh, so that we can put pressure on people and, and just uh, do things that, because people are funny about money. And it, it, all it takes is just one time to offend somebody by the way that we talk about money, and they may never come back to the church again because they get offended. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but uh, it can happen. Paul goes on, he says, this is a blessing, and uh, you're not doing it out of covetousness, but out of uh, love. But this I say in verse 6, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So, that's a universal principle we find in the the Bible talks about casting your bread upon the water and after many days it shall return to you. You know, uh, it's amazing how the Lord blesses His people and meets their needs. Uh, we've never had a lot of money. Uh, we've always struggled from week to week to get along. Uh, after the kids are all grown, we've had it a little bit easier. But... Uh, you know, the, the money that God blesses us with as we give and share with other people. Uh, I had uh, this person that calls me usually once every month when they get down to the end of their money and they need $75 or $100, and they'll call me and say, could you please, or they'll text usually say, could you let me have this? And uh, my flesh, I'm thinking now, they're just expecting this every month that I'm going to do this. And uh, I remember one time I, I called this person. I said, look, I kind of got in the flesh a little bit. And I said, every month, the only time I hear from you is when you want money. You never call me and say, how you doing? You know, what's going on? But when the phone rings and I see your name, I know what it is. You want money. And uh, 
I, I kind of rebuked this person a little bit. And I'm telling you what, God whipped me for the next three days. I got so convicted and I thought about, uh, you know, the, them having to go without food or electric. And, uh, and I'm telling you, the Bible talks about when someone asks of you and has need and we turn them down, uh, when we could meet that need, that God takes note of that. And uh, I know we don't, we don't like to be taken advantage of, but, uh, you know, there are people that really do get to the end of the month and they can't pay their electric. They can't, uh, they can't buy their food. And uh, that, how, how would we like to be in that situation? We wouldn't, would we? And uh, so I called back and I said, listen, I apologize. I'm sorry uh, because God has blessed me so much and given me so much least I can do is share with you when you need it. I said, I, I don't want you to call me when you don't really need it, but if you need it, uh, I'll help you. And we've seen the Lord pay us back a hundred, a hundredfold. God's been so good. And uh, I think when we give from our heart, even though uh, people may take advantage, if you give from your heart, God will reward you. He talks about, uh, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher, and I don't believe in this uh, stuff that a lot of these uh, charismatic preachers preach, but uh, I, I know, you know, times when I've maybe had a situation where I was in real need. I remember one time in Bible college, uh, I didn't know how I was going to make it through the rest of the week. Didn't have any money. I didn't know if I had enough gas to get to work and back. And uh, Brother Range, we were in chapel uh, at Bible college. Brother Range, I was walking by and he grabbed me by the arm and he said, God told me to give you this. And I opened it up and it was like two $20 bills. And nobody told Brother Range that I needed that. But he gave that. Brother Roy Humble, when he was a missionary, every time that he would see me, he would put a 20 or a 50 in my hand. And I, I mean, we'd see sometimes two or three times a week. And every time I saw him, he'd reach money in my hand. And I'd say, Brother Humble, you don't need to do that. And he said, listen... I made a vow to God, and I've done this all my life. And uh, he said the Lord always repaid him, and uh, I believe it. The Lord always repays his people, and he pays well. And so Paul says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth, a cheerful giver. And if you look that word up, it means hilarious. It means to give, you know, other people look at you. When I started tithing and uh, my dad saw me putting money in the offering and he was there at church and I remember I'd, I'd sold, I was a vacuum cleaner salesman for uh, several months and I sold seven vacuum cleaners in one week. I made four or five thousand dollars, and I, I put a bunch of hundreds in the offering plate, and it went by. And my dad, he was reaching his hand out to grab that money and pull it out, and I said, "Dad, that belongs to the Lord." And uh, he said, "Why are you giving that to the preacher?" And I said, "I'm not giving it to the preacher. I'm giving it to the Lord." Uh, a lot of people don't understand that what you purpose in your heart, what God deals with your heart about and shows you what you should give, then that's what you do. And that's how you're o obedient to the Lord. Just like the Lord deals with me about anything else, the Lord deals with my heart about my tithes and offerings. And when it comes Sunday, one of the first things I do in the morning is write out the check and pray over it 
uh, that God will use it. And uh, that, I mean, it'd almost be like walking out with it without my arm because God puts that in my heart. And so Paul says, uh, you don't do it grudgingly. You don't do it of necessity. But God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. And we want to specifically look at verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Isn't that an amazing statement? Uh, something that abounds is, it's, it's like a basket running over. It's like at harvest time when you, you go out to gather your crop and instead of it being what you thought, thought, it's maybe twice as much as what you thought you'd get. Because God makes His grace abound toward us. Now, I don't know how God does it, but He does. And uh, He makes little money go far when you use it wisely, and He adds to you many other blessings because of that. Uh, so Paul says, this grace abounds toward you, always having all sufficiency, notice that, always having all sufficiency, meaning that all of your needs are completely met. I mean, your, your necessities are, you know, shelter and food and clothing and the things that we really need in order to live our lives. God provides those things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of poverty in our country. Uh, you get out sometimes visiting places, and I've, I've, I know Kathy's told me about when she was a nurse in Madison County, and she would visit in the homes, and you would go by a home and go inside, and they'd have a dirt floor. I'm, I'm telling you, a dirt floor, no carpet, no tile, dirt. And uh, one man had a tree growing up through his house that he hung his clothes on. But he had a dirt floor. He didn't have much. And, uh, you know, whether it was his fault or whatever it might be, there are lots of people that way. Lots of people don't have an indoor bathroom. Lots of people. I mean, I grew up, uh, my grandma and grandpa, they, they uh, never had a, a bathroom indoors until I put it in for them. When I was about 18 years old, I put my grandma an indoor bathroom in myself, and uh, you ought to just heard her. I mean, here she was, 70-something years old, and had never had an indoor bathroom. And she was just going on, oh, I've got a shower. And she was turning it on, and I got a bathtub and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, her only bath was warming up water on the stove and using soap and a, a washcloth to take a bath in. I told Kathy when I was growing up, we'd all take a bath on Friday or Saturday night, and you'd get the bath water ready by heating it on the stove, a wood stove, and once you got a bathtub of water, then you'd start in order. Uh, you know, Grandma would usually take a bath, and Mom, and then we lived right close to my grandparents, and there'd be about nine or ten of us all take a bath in the same water. You might heat it up a little bit. You've done it. Yeah, I have. Yeah. I had three sisters. I had to follow. Them. <laughs> well, uh, but you know, we never did get no disease or anything like that, and uh, uh, it was really kind of fun when I look back on it. You know, thing about Grandpa and his long johns, and he'd a lot of times take his bath in his long johns, and and then uh, they'd say, "Okay, it's your turn," and uh, but. Uh, you know, people live uh, tough times, and God's been so good to us, probably most of us, you know, we have nice bathrooms, and we have running water, refrigerators, stoves, uh, and folks, listen, this has not been something people has had except here in the last 50, 60 years. 
You go back 100 years, 200 years ago, and people just had basic things that we couldn't imagine. It is a lot of fun going to the outhouse when you got about a foot of snow. <laughs> you know, it, it's pretty cold, but uh, you get to enjoy the scenery. Uh, lots of things that we look back on, and God has been so good. He's provided our needs. He makes everything sufficient in all things that we abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to talk about living under pressure and how God meets our needs. One of my favorite uh, scriptures is Psalm 23. I can't tell you how many times that I, during the course of a week, how many times that I repeat Psalm 23. Last night, I couldn't sleep. And uh, I just laid awake and just said Psalm 23 over and over, over, over. And every time I said it, I felt this comfort. I felt this peace. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod, Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy <laughs> shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Cleveland Clinic, a doctor there who was one of the first doctors, uh, he was a psychiatrist and he was a Christian man, psychologist, or psych psych he dealt, dealt with the psyche of people. And uh, he had so many people depressed, and people suicidal. And uh, he always remembered the joy he got from Psalm 23. So here's what he started doing. When a person would come in depressed or uh, suicidal, he would prescribe, he'd write on his prescription pad, Psalm 23, three times a day. Once in the morning, once at noon, and once before you go to bed. And he gave a testimony. I have his book at home. And he, he said that hundreds of thousands of people not only were helped, but were cured from depression and being suicidal by simply reading Psalm 23 three times a day and meditating on the Word. It'll build you up. You may be beat down and, and feeling like nobody loves you, feeling like everything is turned on you. But when you go to the Lord and you, uh, you seek His help, it's amazing what a turnaround it can make in your life. It's happened so many times. People are under a lot of pressure today. The world professionally speaking, are so keyed up. Home life is full of nerve-wearing problems, such as worry over the children. Uh, we don't know if we're prepared for the social conditions that our children live under. There's godless psychological theories that uh, refuse many of the healthy restraints which benefit families and social life. Young people are throwing their lives away and living for things that will not satisfy. And much of the pressure today is because of uncertainty. There's uncertainty about big things, about business. There's uncertainty uh, about uh, where I'm going to spend eternity. International issues, all sorts of things that we see. Individual workers 
housewives uh, that uh, go through so many different trials where they have to work and they try to take care of the home and be a good wife and do all that. And then husbands trying to work their job and take care of their families and all of those things. There's constant pressure. Life itself becomes nothing but anxious thoughts. Anxiety, uh, Dr. Uh, Gary Collins says, anxiety breeds worry. Worry breeds tension. Tension breeds strain. And strain breeds pressure. These things that come in our lives start out with a little anxiety about, you know, what's going to happen and what the future holds. And we're unsure about it. And so we, we start letting anxiety come into our life. And then the next thing you know, that anxiety has bred worry. And worry is where you actively begin to produce scenarios in your head about what's going to happen. And we think the worst is coming. You know, we look at it like, oh, this is going to happen. I know it's just going to be awful. And we let that get into our hearts. I can tell you that so many times when I've been worried about something, God turned it around and brought something good out of it when I was dreading it and thinking it was going to be something bad. I'm sure it's happened in your life as well. And so worry brings tension, strain, pressure. And then Paul said, remember in 2 Corinthians 1.8, I'd like you to look there with me for just a minute so that you know that you're not the only one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 8, the Apostle Paul said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. That's the Apostle Paul. And none of us are exempt from this. You know, uh, when you get so many different things coming at you at one time and you're not giving them to God and releasing them to the Lord and you stop worrying and learn to trust by faith. Remember the Lord said you cannot add one, one bit to your stature by worrying. You cannot change anything by worrying about it. That's not going to change it. But yet, Paul, even here as a man of God, talked about everything that was coming at them, and they despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in our, ourselves, but in God, which raised the dead, Amen. who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. I tell you, that's all you can do. Bad times come, troubles come, things are out of your hands, you've got no control over. You've done your best, you, you've tried to be honest, and, and you've worked hard, and yet all of a sudden there's something comes at you where people try to destroy you. When you know in your heart that you've not done anything wrong, and if you don't give it to God, it will eat you alive. That's right. It will send you to the grave. But with our trust in our God who delivers us, we know that we have the victory through Him. Excuse me. Now, to the child of God in these challenging days, we see that the Christian life has never been easy, never will be easy. Even though Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, 
for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul, for my burden is easy, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's still not easy. We, we are constantly under pressure. Uh, it's when you think about the cries of persecution that has come from the saints of old. Day after day of inward pressure tends to wear one down both nervously and spiritually. You know, uh, when I was growing up, you'd often hear about people having nervous breakdown. We don't hear about that anymore, but it still happens. Uh, it's like people get to a point where they have, have, have tried and they fought and maybe some dramatic thing happens and uh, they just can't go on anymore. They can't go on at the pace they run. And you know, it's like uh, being in a marathon. If you take off running too fast in a marathon, what's going to happen? You're going to be beside the road and you're, gonna, you're not going to have any energy left for the race. Uh, a lot of times people will, you know, they'll think, boy, I'm just going to go at it and I'm going to get out there in front and I'm going to lead the pack. And then about several years passes and you see them over in the ditch line and uh, they couldn't keep up because they, they weren't trusting God and giving it to the Lord and resting in Him. Does our Christian joy, peace, and patience survive under strain? Does it merely struggle or does it thrive amid that? The prince of evil will make Christ's people his priority target in these last days. Remember, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 of what's going to happen in these last days. Men are going to they're going to love pleasure more than they love God. And the hearts of many is going to wax cold. And uh, we are told throughout the Word of God of the things that are going to take place in this world. Uh, I believe the coming of our Lord is drawing nigh. Amen. I pray for it every day. And I, I look, uh, Brother Philip was talking about the stars here recently, how pretty they've been, and I, I've been noticing that too. Every time I come out, I look up the stars at night and see Venus and the different uh, parts of the solar system, and I just stand there, my jaw just drops. Amen. And I just look up there and I think, my, what a God you are. You're, what a God you are. That's right. Wow. And we only know so little about it uh, we just know a fraction about it. But God is so gracious and good. And even if you just take 30 minutes and stare up at that creation and maybe take a walk down by the creek and pick up a rock and skip it along or you maybe pick up a crawdad and look at him or you, you just watch nature, see a little squirrel. This morning I was coming to church and I pulled up a stoplight and I looked over and there was a big fox squirrel. And he was just sitting there as pretty as you please, eating on a nut. And he was going. And I was sitting there watching him. And then somebody pulled up behind me, and I sort of looked at my mirror, and I looked over, and that fellow was gone. I mean, I don't know where he went. I mean, it was a bare area, and it was 30, 40 feet, but he was gone just like that. And I stopped and thought, wow, what a creature. God made that little squirrel, created him made him the way he is, all these beautiful birds that fly through the sky, and all these animals and creatures that live upon the earth. Uh, it's just amazing. And those things help us to take our mind off of our trouble. You see, when we're pressed out of measure, that word that Paul uses, pressed out of measure, uh, it has several prefixes that changes it. Depressed, suppressed, repressed, oppressed. All these are states in which the adversary wants to bring us through pressure. He wants to get you depressed. I've been depressed many times. 
He wants to suppress us. He wants to repress us. He wants to oppress us. But over against all this is the all-sufficiency of our triune God, the Father above, the Son beside us, the Spirit within us. Think about that. Paul said in our text, in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Toward you. That's talking about you as an individual. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Sufficiency in everything. Of all these alls, multiplied assurances, our Lord is inexhaustibly adequate for every need. He can keep us serene amid strain. He can give us patience in our trials. If only there is a daily yieldedness and prayerfulness on our part, God will work on our behalf. On the desk of a, a busy uh, writer in London not long ago, there stood uh, a small clump of lavender. It was sent to him by a little lady who was blind. She lived alone in an apartment in, near his business, and she wanted to encourage him, so she sent him lavender, and she wrote him a note. And she said in the note, Pressure, if applied properly, can bring out the perfume. And you know they say that if you smell lavender, that it'll help you to relax and it comforts you. I know I've uh, gone in when I was getting stuff done to my back. I went in and, and uh, people would have different fragrances. And I would suddenly feel this calmness from just the fragrance of that perfume. And our lives are a living sacrifice unto God. And as we worship Him through our trials, there is a glorious perfume. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel offered their sacrifice, God would smell the aroma and it would please Him. In Psalm 23, the psalmist was uh, experiencing some very difficult times. And he said, the middle verse has always been my favorite. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice it's a shadow. The shadow of death. Because death has been defeated. Death is no sting. The grave is no victory. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what's the next phrase say? I will. Fear no evil. I will. Now that's, that's a part of your permission. Mm -hmm. You can take fear into your heart and let it eat you up. Right. Or you can say, I will fear no evil. I probably use that more than any other verse a couple years ago, I went to see a lady in the hospital, and uh, I'd prayed about what to read her, and I was going to read her that verse. And I went in, and she was just shaking and just so nervous and scared because she had had a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, I came in, prayed with her, we sang a song together. And then I read Psalm 23 and I got to that verse and I said, now listen, you can let fear overcome you. And you take it into your heart and give it permission and it'll rule and reign. But you can say fear, you have no part in my life because I'm trusting God. He's going to give me the victory. Whether we live or whether we die, we live unto the Lord, we die unto the Lord. And when we have that faith and that trust, it removes that fear and that doubt. I will fear no evil. Why? You're with me. We were
were little, we wanted our mom to go with us to the doctor. When I went to the dentist, I wanted my dad to go and hold my hand. He didn't get to go, and I went in, and I felt so alone. But as a child of God, it's like some lady was saying the other day. They said, well, you're going to be alone. She said, listen, I'm never alone because I've got the Lord. And as long as the Lord is with me, I will never be alone. May God bless you and help you, give you strength. Let's all stand together. Brother, if you'll come.